for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. Yeah, man. Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the masses uh, yeah how you doing today's wednesday april 14th 2021 105 days into the new year only 260 days left we are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of nowhere a total undisclosed location. That's right. But it is beautiful. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? (laughs) Yeah, man. I'm all fired up. I'm ready. Tonight, Tracy Austin is here. She's here to talk about her new book. It is called I Survived Beyond and Back. Tomorrow night is another fader night with open lines all night long. Can't wait for that. Can't wait for Tracy. What a show last night. Serena Wright Taylor. Oh, man. What a show. What what a week. What a week. Tonight, Tracy Austin is here. And, of course, she is a host of her own show here at uh, KGRA. And uh, she's been doing this for a very long time. And this is a good book, and uh, which I have and I have read. So, tonight... Is going to be unique tonight. We're doing um, NDEs and near death experiences, and I'll talk more about that in just a bit. But we've had quite a few guests over the years on the show, and this is one of. And again, I'm going to talk about this more in a bit. But this is one of those subjects that we all think about, and I can't. I can't wait for the conversation to start tonight with uh, Tracy and myself. So she'll be here at the bottom of the hour. And there you go. Now, um, as you can see, the the bunker is starting uh, to come together. Uh, we're getting there. And it's really funny. I posted pictures today of, of the wall, um, which still isn't done. There's more to hang and and things and, and, and stuff. But anyway, so I posted. And, and Carolyn Ford, <laughs> she replied. She said, hey. We got to have some crystal skulls displayed. And I was thinking uh, about this all week, how to do it. And and I've got a few ideas, but we're going to get some crystal skulls back there. And it's, uh, you know, I've got, I've got some here, of course, but want to do something unique with it. And, and I'm playing with a few ideas and I think I've got something that is going to be really, really cool. And it's got to be lit right and things. But looking forward to that. And uh, thank you, Carolyn, for uh, jumping in and reading my mind. Because I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. And I think I've got it done. And if you want your own crystal skull, go visit Carolyn Ford 
over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Use that promo code Jimmy. We'll get you 15% off of your Crystal Skull order today. Now, uh, coming up, and I've been warning everybody, this con- this conference is going to sell out. It's UFO MegaCon. I will be there June 6th through the 12th in Laughlin, Nevada. I want you to come hang out with all of us. And, of course, we'll have the Fade to Black blue- booth there. And uh, we- we're going to be there all week. Now, this is the deal. It's limited ticket sales. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So limited ticket sales, but it's in person, real live people. And we all get to hang out. And I need this so bad. I need it. I need to hang out with all of you. So fade or nots, go to the website. The links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. Click go get your tickets now. I don't want it to sell out from underneath you. And and then you're going to see me posting pictures of all the fade or nots hanging out. And you're going to go, oh, I shouldn't. I, oh, man. You don't want to be that person. Go and get your tickets now. The banners are over at jimmychurchradio.com. Follow me on Twitter. It's hump day. Yes, it is. It's Wednesday. Uh, it is hump day. And you can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. I, uh, I'm thinking about the weekend in front of me. I am slammed. I, I Normally, I get to relax on Friday. Not this weekend. New. No. But anyway, it's hump day for the rest of you. I'm working all weekend. Follow me on Twitter at JChurch Radio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. Hashtag F2BQ is fade to black questions for everybody except for Mark Tarana. All right, let's get to the breaking news. Crazy day in the news world. Bernie Madoff, whose name became synonymous with financial fraud, died while serving a 150-year prison sentence, federal prison, He was 82 years old. His death today at the Federal Medical Center in the prison in Bootner, North Dakota, or North Carolina, (laughs) North Dakota, North Carolina, was confirmed by the U.S. Bureau of Prisons. Cause of death was not released today, but Madoff was the mastermind behind a $20 billion Ponzi scheme, the largest financial fraud in history. And so... I'm reading the breaking news on this today, and I'm thinking to myself, I thought he already died. <laughs> it was, it's like, Bernie's dead. He died today, and I scratched my head. I thought Madoff died. Now, maybe it was, and, and, and I, I read that he tried to get out of prison back in February of uh, 2020 liver failure or whatever who cares but oh, i don't want to talk bad of the dead but but that guy anyway maybe it was that but it seemed i thought i thought bernie died years ago well he died today i don't want to say mandela effect but man that felt weird all right well today it happened the white house formally announced the decision to end america's longest war did all of this earlier today deeming the prolonged and intractable conflict in Afghanistan no longer aligned with American priorities. U.S. troops will withdraw from Afghanistan before September 11th, the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. All of that launched the war. The war in Afghanistan has killed some 2,300 U.S. troops and has cost more than two trillion dollars it was announced today that russian president vladimir putin has signed off on plans for his country to begin the construction of a manned orbital satellite to eventually replace the international space station which appears to be on its last legs in recent years the iss has begun to fall apart with astronauts you know frequently discovering leaks Last week, it was, man, what is in my throat? It was revealed that Russian cosmonauts were working on plugging a leak first noticed in 2019. The ongoing problems with the International Station has prompted Moscow to begin creating a replacement. It's called ROSS, the R-O-S-S, 
the Russian orbital satellite will consist of three to seven modules and will carry up to just four people. Seems kind of small to me. Let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to today. One of my favorites, the one and only Anthony Michael Hall. Today is 53 years old. The Breakfast Club. Weird Science. How about 16 Candles? How about National Lampoon's Vacation? Anthony Michael Hall. Uh, Robert Carlyle. Today is 60. And Robert, he's a great actor, but he was amazing as Dr. Rush in Stargate Universe, one of my favorite series, and ended after two seasons. And ended on a cliffhanger, too. Didn't make sense. Adrian Brody today is 48. Great in so many movies, but for me, it was Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel. And I'm going to end up with this. Guitar God. Richie Blackmore today is 76 years old. And I could go on and on, but uh, burn, right? Highway star. Yeah. You know, smoke on the water, of course, but, but burn machine head, both of those albums, the entire thing, just absolutely amazing. Happy birthday, Richie Blackmore on this day in history, 1865. President Abraham Lincoln is shot in the head at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. The assassin, John Wilkes Booth, shouted, Sic Semper Tyrannus, the South is avenged. Then he jumped to the stage, went out the back, and fled on horseback. Lincoln died the next morning. Fader fact. All right, now listen. I get to the fader facts. And it's always unbelievable, but it's a fact, and it was vetted, and then I present it to you. This next one is unbelievable, but it's a fact. In 1996, Mother Teresa, that's right, the Mother Teresa underwent an exorcism in her hospital bed before her death. All of this was after her friend, Henry D'Souza, an archbishop, witnessed strange behavior by her and believed that she was possessed by the devil. That's right. And that is your fate of... Look it up. Look it up. I know what you're saying right now, Jimmy. Come on, man. Yeah, that's your fate of fact. Tonight, very special guest, Tracy Austin is here going to be talking about her new book i survived beyond and back and uh, we've got a few ways that we are going to structure the show tonight with tracy i am really looking forward to this conversation and then of course tomorrow night need a cough drop (laughs) now i'm good now tomorrow night's another fader night with open lines all night long you know i was thinking today as i hit this river moon coffee Mm. so good it's got two 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 shots of espresso in the top oh so good Mm. does that make noise when i drink does it does that go into the microphone as i suck the coffee out of that thing i was thinking today i was like you know fader night what if we just took down one guitar at a time and talked about it. Each one of the guitars behind me, it's got its own story. You know, you know, it's weird. I'm looking at the camera. You only see half of them, but each one of these has got a story behind it. And you know what they are. I was thinking, man, that, that would be kind of fun. Mark from Dallas. All right. <laughs> Rivermoonwellness.com. And you know, I'm going to take the lid off. I I leave the lid on because you don't want stuff to spill into your electronic gear. That's why I'm going to take my sip over here. Ah. 
Tonight, Tracy Austin is here. We're going to be talking about NDEs. And when it comes to near-death experiences or NDEs, I do everything that I can, like most of you, to research and learn more about this fascinating subject because it just frankly blows my mind. And there is so much to consider here with NDEs. You know, uh, f from what happens to your consciousness and your soul after your body gives up, right? Then you have the, the pure medical and science side of it. What is going on here? All the way over to the, you know, the different religious and spiritual beliefs that, that go back, quite frankly, thousands of years. And here's the other thing. There are two basic questions, two, two basic questions that humans have always asked themselves going just, you know, I am sure that Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens sapien back in the day pondered, you know, where do we come from? You know? Why are we here? What, what happens after we die? Everybody thinks about it. Now, we sort of know more about the first question. You know, we're able to analyze DNA and look back and archaeology and anthropologist and, and trying to figure out those questions. Um, now, I say sort of because Homo sapiens sapien, of course, just appeared out of nowhere. We don't know how we got here. But we're trying to figure it out, and we have science behind us, and, and we're trying to figure it out. But we know. But that last question, you know, what happens after we die? That, that question is still a complete mystery with no definitive answers. Don't know. Now, I've told the story many times about my little month-long visit to the hospital when I was 20. 20 years old and was it an official NDE now not going into the details of all of that once again but I think about it a lot and I'm not sure the facts are that I was totally out for about four days all right and I've told everybody about this before but during that time, I didn't have any of the things happen that we normally hear about. You know, a, a bright light at the end of a tunnel, you know, angels meeting people from our past, family, friends, you know, uh, out of body, uh, above your bed and looking down at, at yourself and, and doctors or things, you know, no, right? Seeing your life flash in front of you. You know, all of that stuff. Well, none of that happened to me. In fact, my experience, and this, I can only share what happened to me, my experience. My experience was the exact opposite. I had no bright light. I was only in blackness, like this bunker. I was alone, right, at a table in chairs, uh, that, that was lit from above, you know, but I was alone. I didn't need anyone. And my life certainly didn't play out, uh, for me. That didn't happen either. All right. No astral body. I wasn't looking at myself. I wasn't out of my body. None of that happened. Now here's the deal. I ended up making friends with all of the nurses and doctors on my floor because it turned out that I was the only patient that was under like the age of 70. And you know, I'm a, I'm a 20 year old long haired rock and roll dude, 1980, whenever that was 83. And, uh, uh, I was different from everybody else on the floor and I'm not kidding about this. And, I could actually talk, right? Oh, man. Well, anyway, 
So they would all kind of hang out with me. And at night, I had this nurse named Tiny. And she, she was pretty small. Her name was Tiny. And uh, she, was, she was really cool. That was her name, right? Okay. Uh, maybe she had a different name. I don't know. A real name. But Tiny uh, was my friend at night. And um, I was awake all night long. And we would talk and hang out. There wasn't a lot for her to do. She would do her rounds and, and stuff. And then come back and just hang out with me. And she would also go down to the doctor's cafeteria for me at night. Right? And bring me back steaks. I'm not joking. Real food. Italian food. Whatever was in the doctor's cafeteria, man, was in my hospital room at night. And uh, she was awesome. But anyway, back to the story. So none of the nurses or the doctors were telling me anything. You know? And they were keeping me informed, but they were keeping me informed about other stuff. But I could sense that they were holding back on something. And it was Tiny who spilled the beans. All right. Now, this is what happened. She slipped up one night. And we were sitting, you know, we were sitting talking and, and she slipped up and she said something like, you know, you really had us scared. During those four days, we didn't think you would make it. Your temperature was going from 90 to 103 and back to 90 every hour. And we couldn't stop it or figure it out. And I was like, what? <laughs> and she said, see, that's why we couldn't tell you anything. We didn't want to freak you out. We were told to keep quiet. And I could tell, I could tell that they were holding back something. So, yeah, I was totally freaked out. But, but I knew. I knew at that time, speaking with her, that I was out of the woods, right? I was slowly getting better. I was feeling better. The pain and things, it was still there, but now everything was manageable. I couldn't walk. I couldn't get out of bed, and I had IVs in me and, and things that were being changed every two and four hours, 24 hours a day. It was a miserable experience, but I could tell I was getting better. And I kept thinking, especially after she told me all of this, I kept thinking about those four days, you know, and my whole thing with it has always been that it was all just a dream. It was just a dream. And I still think that today. Okay. But Here's the real deal. I've never had that dream again. I've never been able to go back to that place. And I have tried. I've tried and I've tried a lot. So what was it? Was it an NDE? I honestly don't know. But we all have dreams that repeat. I know that I do. And it's pretty easy to make it happen. Just, yeah, right before bed. Yeah, I want to dream about that and you do i do i know that you can do it right but not that four day dream of me in that blackness sitting at that table writing music it it no it only happened that one time one long four day continuous, unbroken, seamless dream. Now, if it happens again, what? Right? Well, I'll certainly tell all of you. Seriously, I'll do that. But what if it happens again? Right? That dream, that experience, that place. Is it because I'm in a bad situation health-wise? There's a medical emergency. There's something going on, and I go back to that place. I don't want to have to go through an emergency, an emergency room. and I don't want to go through that to get there. But if I do get there, is it because of this, of a medical emergency? Does that classify as an NDE? I don't know. Now, reading, and I was speaking with Tracy uh, about this right before the show tonight, and that is this. 
in reading her book and speaking with others, so many others that have had NDEs, I listened to their experience, and mine has nothing to do with it. Nothing. Nothing. So is it an NDE? I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think it was a dream, a dream that has never repeated. There you go. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black Tonight. Tracy Austin is here. We are talking about NDEs tonight. Her new book, I Survived Beyond and Back, is out. We're going to be talking about that. Some great experiences in the book. We're going to be going through those two as well for those that have survived. We're going to talk about Tracy personally. It's going to be one of those nights here on Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, of the Game Changer Network and KGRA the planet follow me on twitter right now at j church radio email is jimmy at jimmy church radio.com i'll be right back after this short break with tonight's guest tracy austin stay with us This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. This is the only way forward. This is Made to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, folks. It's trembling times, and fear is pushing emotions, which in turn pushes health the wrong direction. Do you ever get an ache because life is uneasy? Try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea works on your digestive tract, helping to move food through quicker and comfortably so your health is spot on. Life Change Tea may not help with world issues, but it will help with your digestive issues. A glass a day helps keep the intruders away. So, change your life today. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. If your health game is off, get on by ordering Life Change Tea. GetTheTea.com. And while you're on our site, look around at the great non-GMO organic supplements. And if you're a sales shopper, go to our specials page and see what's for you. I've been drinking the tea for 12 years, and I'm sure glad for its health benefits. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. GetTheTea.com. The tea that makes you go. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. 
Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Tonight, Tracy Austin. Tomorrow night is another fader night with open lines all night long. Tracy is back with us to discuss her new book. It's called I Survived Beyond and Back. True accounts of near-death experiences from those who have glimpsed the afterlife. Having completed various studies at Cauldron College of Further Education in 1984, Tracy relocated to London a year later to study at the Guide Hall School of Music and Drama as a concert pianist and to teach her instrument in a number of schools. Her interest in UFOs and all things strange first began there when she witnessed a UFO. Now, research into the UFO phenomena has been an ongoing process since her first sighting back in 1987. And she has investigated some highly strange UFO activity. Personal sightings of UFOs continue to this date. She is the author of Welcome to Haunted Las Vegas and Alien Encounters in the Western United States. Tracy's previous TV show, Let's Talk Paranormal, won three, three telly awards for its excellence. Her website is thetracyaustinshow.com. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only Tracy Austin. Tracy, good evening. How are you? Hey there, Jimmy. I'm great. How are you? Man, you sound fantastic. Oh, thank you. I think that might be a little bit of help from you. Oh, man. <laughs> you sound like you're right here. And this is uh, this is great for the both of us. Uh, you know, we're both hosts. Uh, we've uh, both done a, a lot of radio and television over the years. And I really enjoy it for me personally. When I have another host on the show, It, it I, I, I sort of can take a night off. Right, I can just <laughs> let things ride, and I'm excited about uh, tonight, Tracy. But before we get there, how have you been? It's been a while since you've been on the show. It's been a while. Um, I've been busy, uh, obviously trying to get this new book finished and out there to the public. It's been about a year and a half in the making. Um, also quite tired at times. I have a 19-year-old cat who is diabetic and has kidney issues. So I really don't sleep that well, Jimmy, to be honest, because I'm up feeding her every two or three hours. So it's uh, life's a little difficult when you're caring for an animal. Yeah, it is. And we're caring for everybody these days. And uh, it, it's been a, a, a trying uh, time for the entire planet. But I really appreciate you taking the time tonight to come out and and hang out with us now. Um, I want to uh, I want to jump back a little bit um, for some of our listeners who may not know about your background. Going back to those college days, and you and I have talked about this before, but all of that caught you by surprise, and it, it's a great it, it's a great story, but it's also part of a life's journey. And, and here we are today talking about near-death experiences. You could have gone on a completely different career path, but when you have that paradigm shift, you know, you have to follow what is in front of you, right? That's right. I really didn't have any choice in the matter, to be honest with you, Jimmy, because, you know, I, I'd always set out to do something with music and have a, have a life in music. I, I first started to learn piano, learn my instrument when I was eight 
years of age. And uh, my, my parents were supportive. They allowed that to happen. And I went on that journey. And um, I did go to London. I went to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. And I studied there uh, to be a, a concert pianist, to have a performing life. I also uh, did some work at the, the London College of Music as well. Um, I had a uh, an ALCM there, uh, which was a, a diploma for performance. So my life was pretty much cut out for me. That's what I wanted to do. But right in the middle of London in 1987, all that kind of changed for me. And it's as if it came finding me. It found me. I didn't go looking for it. And uh, it basically kind of said to me, your life's never going to be the same again because you're going to find out what we're all about and what we do, what we are uh, in terms of, of UFOs. And so that was it. My life changed forward uh, from 1987. Have you found uh, over the years that the the world of high strangeness, right, whether it's paranormal, supernatural, conspiracy, UFOs, ghosts, and EEs, that everything starts to get connected, right? Have you found that? It kind of does, yes. Um, I, I've heard the term before, paranormal soup. It's kind of like a paranormal soup, and it really is. It's like everything into the mix. Everything is part of the, the reality of the paranormal. I've never really considered paranormal to be paranormal, uh, it, to me, it's it's kind of normal. It's it's part of our life. It's part of everyday life. Nothing paranormal about it. And I think it's how we deal with that. It's how we deal with that that, that comes our way that we consider to be paranormal. Um, but these things are with us every day. They're they're part of our existence here on the on the earth plane. So uh, not a great deal we could really do about it. I think it's just trying to accept it for what it is. Is there anything too strange? Not for me. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It, it, it's pretty funny how once you start to go down this path and you, you have your own personal experiences and you hear from others and you start to realize there's, there's anything can happen, right? <laughs> anything. There's nothing really too mm -hmm. strange. Right. The possibilities are endless for, for this kind of uh, genre. Yeah. You know, whether it's paranormal, supernatural, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think many people, when they encounter this kind of thing, they want to deny it, Jimmy. They want to think it's a figment of their imagination or, you know, did they do something to create something? And it's it's not always the case. It's not a figment of the imagination. And no, people don't always do something to create something. It interacts with us. And, and it's just like I said, it's how we interact back with that. Now, and, and here, here you are writing a book about near-death experiences. Is it something that you've thought about a lot uh, over the years? It's, it's a question that we all wonder about, you know, what happens after we die. It's a, a perfectly natural thing to go through. Um, was that part of why you wrote the book? Um, no, not really. I mean, I've always had a belief in the other side. I know that we do survive. I, I've, I've always just had a knowing about that. Um, and, and, and a quick story here. Um, I, I didn't intend to write this book to begin with. What I set out to do was to write a book about strange happenings and strange occurrences within morgues and within funeral homes because there has to be some strange stories that people encounter. Yeah, there's a book there. Oh. There's a, Yeah, there's a book there for sure. <laughs> there's a book there. Well, I live in Las Vegas. I try to reach out to uh, a number of funeral homes and, and while they seem to be interested, nobody really allowed me to go any further with it, even with morgues. And I thought, how the heck am I going to write this book? And I thought, okay, well, you know, I've got to have a plan B just in case. So my plan B was, well, okay, near-death experiences. And I set out to write this uh, around about 2017. 
And I lost my father in November of 2017. So going through that, you know, whole process of grieving, um, it kind of took a back seat. And then I started to write on it slowly, slowly but surely, and it was coming together. And uh, I, <laughs> I started to have communication with my father from the other side as um, mad as that may sound, it's the absolute truth. So in that book, I survived beyond and back. Of course, my father didn't have a near-death experience. He had a, a full transition to the other side. But I call that chapter regarding my father surviving beyond because I do know that consciousness survives beyond the physical form. I now know that. I've always known that. But, you know, in, in Skyping with my parents that lived in the UK, I would all the time talk with them about, you know, now I know you don't want to talk about this, but when you pass, um, whoever passes first, I'd like you to come back and, and show me and tell me that you made it and, and you're okay. Well, of course, my father, actually both of my parents were skeptics, but my father used to kind of just look at me on Skype and he'd roll his eyes and he'd look away and he'd say, okay, Tracy, you know, just trying to appease me because um, he didn't believe in it. But five months after he passed, that's when I started to get communication and it's it's been every single month without fail for three whole years this month it started april in 2018 there's only two months that i had no communication and um how's he how, how's he how's he doing <laughs> he's doing fantastically well <laughs> and what he does jimmy is he he switches the light on in my guest bedroom and um, I didn't know it was my dad at first, actually. And the book, I, I, the book that actually started that communication for me was called Into the Light. And it's written by a doctor, Dr. John Lerma. Um, and uh, to cut a very long story short, about a month after I lost my dad, uh, my partner and I decided to move house. So we, we got a bigger house. We had to buy more furniture, obviously. And I wanted a bigger bookcase because I used to have a, a TV show in California. I had a lot of publishers that would send me books so that I could have authors on the show. And so as I'm putting my books on the bookshelf, I came across this book, Into the Light. And I looked at it and I thought, where the heck has this come from? Why have I never read this book? So I looked inside. I still had the letter inside from the publisher, which was dated 2007. So this was like 10 years later. So I thought, wow, this is interesting. I'm going to read it. So I did and uh, started to read it. I get to a certain chapter. I go into my guest bedroom where it's peaceful. It's quiet to read this book. And um, I'm reading a certain chapter about a, a woman who has stomach cancer named Mildred. And she's in a care hospice. And, of course, Dr. Loma goes by to check on her one morning, asks how she's doing. And she says, well, I'm fine, Dr. Loma, but I have a couple of questions for you. He said, okay, Mildred, what are they? She said, well, why am I, why am I being visited by my deceased loved ones? So he said in the book, so that he wouldn't, you know, frighten her and speed up the process of her death he said to her well you know what Mildred maybe you are seeing your deceased relatives maybe they are popping in to see you just like I do every morning just to check on you she said okay but let me ask you this why am I seeing angels in the corner of my room so he said well tell me more so she said, well, they always stand in this particular corner of the room. They are thus wide. They, are, they reach the height of the ceiling. And they illuminate all this bright white light internally outwards, like a light bulb. And she said, they said to me, Mildred, we cannot communicate with you unless you initiate communication. So she did. And... Uh, I sat back on my chair at that point, Jimmy, and I thought, well, I didn't think. I said out loud, oh, my God, if only my angels would talk to me. I would love for my angels to talk to me. Boom, the light went out. Shut up. Oh, yes, it did. Boom, the light went out. So I sat there for a moment and I thought to myself, bloody hell, what did I just do? What did I just do? So um, 
I sat there. I waited. Nothing happened. I looked at the clock. It said 10 p.m. I thought, well, you know what? It's kind of late. I'll put the book away. I'll read it tomorrow. And that was it. I got off, off. I got up off the chair. I didn't walk halfway past the bed. Boom, the light came back on. At this point, Jimmy, I said to myself, okay, somebody wants to talk to me. So I scooted right up to the bed and I said, look, looking up at the light, I don't know who you are. I don't know whether it's you, my angels that want to talk to me, or even if it's you, dad, but thank you, whoever you are for doing this, because um, I know it takes a great deal of effort to do what you've just done. And I have to thank you and please feel free to come back and visit whenever you want to. And I just was one with the light for a moment. And then I went towards the door, switched off the light, closed the door, and that was it. The next day, I wrote an email to two of my spiritualist medium friends in the UK, told them exactly what had happened. They said to me, both of them said to me, Tracy, this is not the work of angels because angels are of a much, much higher realm. They don't need to be flipping lights on and off to get your attention. This is your dad communicating with you. And uh, it's it's never stopped, Jimmy. It's never stopped since April of 2018. I'm very, very thankful for it. So there was only two months ever that he hadn't appeared. And it was uh, February of uh, 2020 and September of 2020. Now, I don't know why, but those two months I had no communication. But he always switches the light on in the guest bedroom. And in the same token, I've had pennies manifest, feathers inside the home have manifested. And I have uh, fantastic experiences with hummingbirds and dragonflies. Now, you know, you are now... Uh, the crazy lady that talks to ghost. <laughs> then I'm fine with that. <laughs> right. I mean, how does that make you feel? I, I think it's pretty awesome. It's fantastic. And I can't explain to people how the feeling is, unless it's happened to you yourself. Mm -hmm. It's very, very hard to, to put it into words. But knowing that consciousness survives the physical, that there's just something about us, Jimmy, that survives beyond what we are is just, it's phenomenal. Does it relieve uh, some fear and anxiety about the whole idea? Um, it, it does and it doesn't. I mean, I still wonder what it's like. I've, I've never had a near-death experience myself, so I don't know what it feels like to actually go down that path to be sort of on the threshold of death. So I don't know. Um, it's, it's still kind of a mystery. Um, but with dad communicating the way he does, obviously, no pun intended, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. uh, consciousness does survive in, in some form and we retain memories. Um, how much of that, I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's... Uh, it's it's food for thought and it's 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 it gives a certain amount of comfort knowing that yeah okay we survived that's how god planned all of this now as the communication with your father now this show is about near death experiences but but i need to i need to ask you a few questions about this uh, uh, the audience knows my mom passed uh, about 4 years ago and i haven't had any communication with her uh, I was thinking it was going to happen like the next day. Uh, you know, everybody uh, shares these experiences. I've never gone through that. But and, and the communication with your father, is it always with, um, uh, you know, the lights going off where it's something physical? Or are you having conversations? Well, it started off with the light just switching on by itself. And I have to say, I have cats. So there's only my partner, myself, and cats in, in this house. This door, the door to that particular room is always closed because we don't like the cats going in there. So there's no way that the cats can switch a light on. Nobody's switching that light on. I just wanted to make that clear. 
Um, but it started off that way, and you can see the light on from underneath the door. That's how we know that he's visiting. Wow, wow. Um, nice. Yeah. And then um, I went to see John Edward, the psychic medium. He came to Las Vegas in 2019 at the uh, the Red Rock uh, Casino. And uh, I was talking to John uh, about certain things with, with the afterlife. And he said to me and he said to everybody else in the audience, um, you know, the easiest way to actually communicate with a loved one in spirit is to actually write them a letter because they do see it and they do read it. And I thought, oh, my God. So within within a couple of days of uh, going to see John at the weekend, I put it to the test, Jimmy. I had a, a journal on my desk that I had bought several years ago, and it was an absolutely beautiful journal. I didn't want to just write anything in it. It had to be for something important and of significance. So when John said that to me, I thought, aha, I have the journal on my desk. So I used that for dad. And... Um, the Tuesday after the weekend that John had, had come to Las Vegas, I decided to write Dad a letter. And I wrote him a letter just like he was alive. Just, you know, uh, what's how you up? Doing, Dad? How you doing? Yeah. Right. What's right. up? How you doing? How, how are things over there? I hope you're okay. Uh, I just want to tell you I love you. I miss you. Blah, 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 blah. And that was it. Well, within a 24 hour window, the light was switched on in the guest bedroom. So that was proof to me that he'd seen that letter and he'd read it just like John Edward had said to me. Then months down the road, like I said, I started to, and, and John said to me, by the way, if ever you find any pennies, pennies from heaven, as it's called, as they're called, always check the year on the penny because the year is of significance. And I can honestly tell you, Jimmy, every year I've seen stamped on a penny that I have found, not just found, but right there at my feet, has had a significant date. And two of them have had 2017 on them, which is the year my dad passed. So there is significance. Feathers that have just manifested inside the home. Um, just just brilliant things like that. Now, I've heard dad talk to me. Um, Tony Rathman is a dear friend of mine, uh, Tony Sheree Rathman in Arizona. He created the Evox, the Spirit Box. And uh, they were guests on my radio show back in 2018, I believe it was. And so in 2019, I asked Tony if he wouldn't mind, you know, doing a test to see if we could reach my dad. And lo and behold, we did. So I've heard my dad give messages through that Spirit Box and actually, on my cell phone as well, I've had EVPs. So, um, when when you're communicating, okay, and I want you to take this both the right way and the wrong way. When you're communicating, and, and Tony's the best, and Cherie's the best, so no, no question about it. But we hear generalities, right? That. Sometimes I think what is happening could apply to me or could apply to anybody. And and I know you know where I'm going with this. With your communication with your father, was it those did you have that moment where this can only be my father? Yes. Because my dad said things to me in those messages how he would talk to me in the physical life. Right, right. Um, you know, Tony said to me, for example, Tracy, when, when he comes and he switches the light on, try to do an EVP, try to reach him. So I did. And I would sit down in the room. The light was on. He'd switched it on. So I would get my, you know, my iPhone out and I'd start the recorder. And I would talk to Dad and say, hey, Dad, how are you? You know, whatever. I uh, hope you're okay over there. Now, I'm not hearing anything audibly. What I have to do when I decide I'm done with the recording, I would then send it to Tony, who would clean it up right, through right. his software. Right, right. Then he would send me the audio back. And um, that particular moment and that conversation when I'm asking him, I hope you're okay, you can hear my dad say, 
I'm all right. Oh, man. And it's in a whisper. My dad was a very quiet man to begin with. It's very hard to have a conversation with my dad. But they're just things here and there. And that's what he said. And I still have that to this day on audio of him whispering it and saying, I'm all right. But I said to Tony, can we, can we try another test? And we did. And I sent Tony a photograph of me and my dad when my parents came to visit um, in Vegas uh, on my birthday. And this was back in 2011. And I didn't know that Tony was actually going to use that photograph as part of the test. It was just to show him what my dad looked like. Right. But he used it. And, um, and he sent me the audio of, of what he was saying. And uh, he switched on the Evox, as he always does. You know, you can hear the spirits flock to the box. They start talking to Tony. Hey, Tony, or hi, Tony. Um, they address him personally, which is phenomenal. He asks them to step to one side. He's looking for a particular gentleman of the name Dan Austin. And he said, Dan, um, if you can hear me, I'm a very good friend of your daughter. She would love to have a message from you if you're able to to leave her a message. Dan, can you hear me? And I'm holding up a photograph here. And if you can see this photograph, you should know who's in this photograph because one of these people is you. Who is the other person? There is a pause, Jimmy. And you can hear my dad say, that's me daughter. Oh, man. And I was blown <laughs> away. Now, I'm are you... Away. Take me to that moment. I've only got 60 seconds, Tracy, but are, are you sad? Do you feel melancholy? Are you happy? What, what kind of emotions go through you at a moment like that? Well, I can honestly tell you, Jimmy, when I heard that, a whole bunch of emotions, as I write about in the book and that chapter, went through my head. I didn't know whether to laugh, cry. I didn't know what to do. There was Because that's the first time I'd heard my father speak since I lost my father in 2017. So hearing that voice, and you can hear some electronics behind it. I mean, yeah, we don't have a, a voice box when we cross over to the other side. Everything has to be done with the mind. Mm -hmm. And there is some electronics in that voice, but it was very, very clear, very loud. There's no mistaking of when he said that. So I had a whole bunch of, of mixed emotions, to be honest. Man, that Evox freaks me out. It's a tasty box. And, and oh, yeah. the thing is uh, with Tony, he's a genius when it comes to that kind of stuff. And he designs this uh, himself and builds it himself. But that Evox doesn't have any noise right it, it's it's just the voices and it sure. freaks you out because the <laughs> the voices just come out of nowhere and you're not hearing all of that background stuff that you see on all of the uh, the ghost adventure shows and things like that that evox is brilliant and and tony really knows what he's doing i'm glad yes. he went through that experience Let's, uh, let's take our break. Let's get that in. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Tracy Austin. We are talking about her new book, and it is out now. It is called I Survived Beyond and Back. True accounts of near-death experiences from those who have glimpsed the afterlife. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. You can follow me on Twitter at JChurch Radio. Tracy, what's your Twitter? Um, Tracy underscore show. There you go. We'll be right back. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. 
That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Hello, I'm Katie and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the lucky pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Tracy Austin. Tomorrow night, Fader Night. Open lines all night long. Tonight, Tracy is here to talk about her new book. It's called I Survived Beyond and Back. Her website is over at jimmychurchradio.com. You can just click on the link right there, the tracyaustinshow.com, and you can check out the book. And uh, uh, before we move forward, Tracy, where can everybody uh, pick up their own copy? Um, you can go to Amazon.com and you can order it there. That's the, the quickest and easiest place to do that. Other than that, uh, bookstores across the country. 
There you go. I got mine. That's all that matters. I got mine. Uh, now, uh, near-death experiences, NDEs, I need your definition. What is an NDE? Well, it is a – what it is is a near-death experience. It's when somebody reaches the threshold of death. They don't quite go over to – Full death, full transition of death. Uh, of course, Dr. Raymond Moody is the person who coined the phrase near-death experiences. Um, an NDE, a near-death experience, can be considered as a a subcategory, if you like, of an OBE, an out-of-body experience, um, but happens under different circumstances and, and basically is a, is a forced out of body experience usually happens during a, a, a critical near death condition and can occur due to trauma to the body coming so close to death. For example, cardiac arrest, a drowning, childbirth, a coma, or any other kind of life threatening condition. Um, an OBE, little different, it can naturally occur to anyone while the body is either resting, sleeping during um, meditative states, during sensory deprivation, dehydration, sleep disorders, dream dreaming, and can be self-induced at a person's will. Um, I've had an OBE. I have not had an NDE. Is there a medical classification for this? Um, you know, for death, I mean, for death, I mean, when is somebody, and, and I, I'm asking for two different reasons. One, what does, uh, the medical community consider somebody that has died? What has to occur? And for near death experience, how, because you come back, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've died and come back. How long? Can you be dead for five seconds and come back? And is that considered an NDE or is that not long enough? You know, are there, are there, uh, standards for this? No, people, people can have near death experiences that only last a matter of seconds. Right. Uh, and it also depends if they flatlined. Usually most do. Um, but there are, you know, accounts in my book where they haven't flatlined, but have had, that near-death experience that have crossed that threshold and met with, uh, in, in a number of cases, deceased relatives or they've met with the angelic realm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some people can be gone for a few seconds. And, and by the way, there's no, it's it's hard. When, when I was researching this and I was talking to the um, the subjects in the book, it was hard for them to tell me what time, how long they'd been gone, mm. because there is no time in the afterlife. There is no time. And they thought they had gone far longer than what they had gone for. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's no question. It, it, it all depends on what the reason is. And it can be literally, uh, you know, five, five minutes, four or five minutes. Now, what have you learned now that the book is done and you've interviewed uh, so many subjects uh, for the book? What have you learned when you walk away from this and think about it? It's really been confirmation for me, Jimmy, that I've always known that this is not it. Uh, there is something beyond the physical that the science community is now beginning to understand. I mean, 50 years ago, you couldn't really talk about this kind of thing. Um, but now science is, is becoming more and more open to it. And that um, there, it's, it seems to be what they're finding is that the, the mind and the brain are two completely separate things, which I find fascinating. And in the book, I do actually interview a doctor, Dr. Lauren Belch, who I had on my radio show. And she is a, um, she's a doctor who takes care of patients in the ICU in, uh, an ICU in the Midwest areas. And, um, she talked to me about 
the patients that she had in the ICU that had encountered a near-death experience and were very eager and open to talk about it to her when, when these kind of things had happened and couldn't wait to say to her, hey, this is what happened to me. Listen to my story. I had a near-death experience. And so it's it's starting to become more and more uh, popular and people are being more open to talk about what happened to them. A little bit like, you know, with UFO sightings, some people sure. don't want to talk about it because of ridicule. Well, and then you have your first UFO sighting and you can't wait for the next one. Is it the same way with NDEs? <laughs> you, know, you, know, it, you know what I mean? Oh, that, that was kind of cool. I think I want to go back. Yeah, I absolutely, Jimmy. And I can tell you that, that everybody I have interviewed about this have all said the same thing. They did not want to come back. They wanted to stay. But they didn't have, well, they did have a choice. And, and in a few of the accounts, they did have a choice and they decided to come back. They, One particular person, uh, he said he was given a second chance in life because uh, he had a cardiac arrest in a grocery store, just placing apples into a bag and had a cardiac arrest doing so. And uh, as everybody, you know, experiences, they're out of their body, they're looking at their body, and they don't realize at first that it's their body that they're looking at. And uh, then they they recognize a little thing, maybe, you know, they've got a tattoo on their, their body, their arm, they're wearing a certain piece of jewelry, a ring or whatever, and they realize, hey, that's me. But they feel perfectly fine, like, who who is that person? And then they realize, that's me. So, um, but once they've experienced that, dimension that different realm of existence um they they describe it that there's they describe it but they say there's really no words to fit it because it's just so beautiful serene peaceful don't want to come back but like i said with the guy in the uh in the grocery store who had a cardiac arrest um he did go walking towards the light but he said he he felt it was wrong to do that. He didn't feel it was the right thing to do. So he decided he's going to turn back around and walk away from the light. And he said at that point, he heard a voice. He heard a male voice saying to him, you've made the right decision. Hmm. And uh, up until that time, he was explaining to the nurse um, in the ICU that he felt, you know, after telling her the story of, hey, I've had this near-death experience while I was in this coma. Um, I was not a good man on this earth. I've had two affairs, uh, illicit affairs. I, so I've not been a great husband. I'm estranged from my children. So I've not been a great father. Um, he said, I was not particularly a religious man. Uh, he was an atheist. He said, but he came back from that near death experience, knowing Jimmy that he had to change his life. He could no longer go forward living the life in the same way that he had done prior to having that NDE. And everybody says the same thing to me that I've interviewed. The experience itself, are they all the same? The white light, the out of body, the meeting uh, people from your past and deceased relatives and the the light at the end of the tunnel, your life flashing before your eyes, the accountability. Is this consistent with, with each one or are they all different? In the majority, Jimmy, yes, they're all alike. They do see a light. Not everybody sees the tunnel, um, but there is a light source that is seen. Um most most times loved ones do come forward or they'll have an angelic presence. But with a couple of the accounts in the book, uh, two, two of them in particular, they don't know how to label it, Jimmy. They don't know whether to label it an NDE or an OBE. So I kind of leave it open in the book because, number one, they said they didn't go to heaven. They didn't, you know, cross over that kind of, threshold where they saw deceased loved ones um one of the cases happened to see an angel uh in full flight with wings completely outstretched Hmm. in a uh, they'd had a car accident 
um, huge car accident, three of them in the vehicle. Uh, I don't want to really spoil the story, but um, he, only he, the person I write about in the book, Miguel, is the person that had that encounter with the angel whose wings were fully outstretched and was in flight, didn't seem to be looking directly at him when he reached that threshold, but seemed to be looking beyond him. So Miguel said to me, it was as if this angel was really looking at the accident, the scene of the accident and what had happened. And then another uh, another account in the book is Moshe, who had also had a an accident in a vehicle, but did not go to the other side as such, didn't go to heaven, didn't really see a light, but knew that he was on the, as he called it, the, the a crossroads. He could have gone there. It, it could have worked out either way. But he said he saw, as, as the vehicle was flipped um, on its side and the roof had caved in and it was resting on the side of his leg, he couldn't open the door. It was embedded in mud. He couldn't get out. Um, everything went quiet and peaceful. And he said he saw a woman walking in front of his car that was like a, a a lady that was from Russia, a Russian peasant woman that was dressed in black. And he said, I tried to grab her attention to come and help me. And she just nodded her head and refused to come and help. And he said, and I wondered if she perhaps didn't want to help because she thought the car was going to explode. Mm -hmm. It was going to set on fire. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was uh, in, in fear for her life, whatever, even though she didn't look physical. He said that she was burned on one side of her face. Um, there was some scarification there from, from this burn. And uh, when the medical team arrived to use the jaws of life to get him out of the vehicle he asked them the question he said can you tell me if it's against the law to help someone when they're in an accident or not help someone or, or yes. not help someone right. yeah and, and they said what are you talking about and he explained and they said there was nobody there we were the first people on the scene and he said no there was a woman that was pacing up and down outside the vehicle, watching me, she would not help. And uh, by the way, I mean, he's he's read the account in the book and he said to me, Tracy, out of every, every time I've told my encounter, my story to somebody, you have nailed it 100%. So I was, I was very happy to do that. Now, um, and how many times uh, have you heard about seeing others right you you you're having this nde and you're encountering other people do other uh have some not seen anybody at all is it a yeah. lone journey yeah some people are, are left alone sometimes when they get to the other side it's complete blackness complete darkness and then they say something starts to happen. They do see a glimmer of light. Um, there's not always deceased loved ones there. There's not always angels. It's like, it's like the guy, like I said to you, in the, uh, the grocery store putting apples in a bag who had the cardiac arrest. There was nobody on the other side for him. He was walking towards that light alone. Yeah, isn't that, doesn't that kind of freak you out a little bit? It's kind of scary. It does. Um, and, and I don't know what the reason is for that, Jimmy, because I know we're always told that, you know, I mean, psychic mediums, the John Edwards of the world, the Matt Frazier's, the uh, Tyler Henry's, to, to Teresa Caputo, they all, all tell us that, you know, the loved ones are there to help us cross over to the other side as right, well as the right, angelic right. realm. Why do some see those and some don't? Because, you know, obviously they're not meant to stay. They're going to come back. That's the whole idea of a, a near-death experience, as it's coined. Um, I, I just, I can't answer that question. I just don't know. Yeah, you would want somebody there to explain to you what the frig is going on, right? <laughs> because oh, absolutely. Yeah, and and I've often thought that um, when you know, like when you're hanging out with a guy like Tony Rathman and and, and of course Cherie. Um, and you're communicating that these spirits to me seem like they're confused. Maybe they're lost. They don't know where they're at. 
you know that's 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 a kind of a scary thought when you're stuck in some place and you don't have anybody to tell you what's actually going on and what to do about it yeah i agree and you know ghosts are different from spirits um ghosts i think haven't made that full trans and i have seen a ghost by the way mine was headless um no that's not right (laughs) (laughs) sans lid (laughs) (laughs) that's not right at all it's not right at all no um and that's a whole nother story but i think they are stuck um in a certain i don't know what to call it a certain time frame i don't know um another dimension Right. But, you know, someone like my dad, he has made that full transition. Now, I I don't know if he's really gone completely over because of the amount of times he comes to visit. Um, I've had a psychic medium tell me that my dad is in between the fifth and the seventh dimension. That's why he makes communication as often as he does. I last had communication with my dad on March the 16th. We're almost coming up to a month. Sometimes this can happen and I keep asking dad, you know, where are you, dad? I haven't seen you for almost a month. I'm kind of getting anxious here. I'm getting a little bit of anxiety. And then he'll come and put the light on. This also is his birthday month on the 23rd. So I'm hoping that I'm going to get some visitation from him this month well if it stops does that mean is it confirmation that he's at a point where he is now too far away you know he's he's he is he is now moved on right i mean are you okay with that if that yes you know i i yes and no first of all this is all about my dad and i want my dad to do what he needs to do on the other side. I, I want my dad to evolve the way my dad has to and, and needs to evolve, sure, whatever that sure. implies. Of course, would I be upset that the communication stops? Absolutely, I would. Because, um, you know, it's like, well, where, where do you go from here? I mean, it's been it's been three years of nonstop communication. And I know there's probably listeners to listening to your show that have had communication from loved ones and don't want it to end. Um, I know somebody, I, I mean, I'm, I'm part of some online groups in Facebook of near death experiences and afterlife. And one lady was, was telling me that her son who made a full transition to the other side communicates to her by switching the light on in the bathroom and leaves things in the bathtub, leaves objects in the bathtub and then someone else told me that uh, one of their deceased loved ones puts the light on in their bedroom, but she's taken out all of the bulbs from the light so that they can't put it on. I would be mortified, Jimmy, to take out every single bulb in the light that my dad could not reach me. I mean, there's no way I could do that. Now, uh, the the other part of it is there did you encounter and then i want to get to some experiences uh but that'll be in the next segment um have you encountered some that claim they've had a near death experience but they didn't and and you were able to figure that out um, well, again, there's just two cases I write about in the book that they're unsure. They don't really know what happened to them. Right. Um, they don't know whether to class it as an NDE or an OBE. But what happened to them was traumatic. And as I said to to you uh, a few moments ago, an NDE really is like a a, a subcategory of an an OBE, an out-of-body experience that happens um, under a forced traumatic situation. And they had a a traumatic situation, which was a head-on car collision. And, uh, and, and, And this happened to not the person in the passenger seat or the driver, but to Miguel, who was in the back seat. And he doesn't know why this happened to him personally. He said, but I I don't know what happened. I don't know if I died. I says, I don't think I did. Um, And I I don't know whether to call it an NDE or an OBE, but I was out of my body. I was in this other realm and there was an angel above me with its wings outstretched in full flight. And it was, uh, he said, it was the most awesome thing I've ever experienced in my life. 
and then again with Masha and his vehicle accident. Um, so it's it's hard for them to try and categorize it. The um, uh, let me look at the clock. I've only got about uh, sixty seconds before the break. Uh, we can stretch it uh, to two minutes. Um, is there also the possibility? of having multiple NDEs in your life? I'm sure the answer is yes, but did you talk with anybody that has had more than one? Yes, and the the first account in the book is by um, is, is for Tommy, who had three near-death experiences, uh, who had a motorcycle accident with his wife, totally lost his wife on the other side. They both passed over together. He decided to come back, Jimmy, for his children because they were very, very distraught. And he talks about how he telepathically was in communication with them while he was on the other side. And uh, his wife remained on the other side. He came back. So he had three altogether in that one incident, um, that whole big motorbike accident. And then uh, I talk about Yvonne, who had two NDEs in a three-week period. No way. Oh, yeah. Now, okay. With Yvonne, I'm very interested in this. We talked about this earlier, not having any issues with going back, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then it does happen. Are you cheating death? Does she feel that, you know, is she special? Is she okay? Or is she upset that now... I've, I've, I've come back twice. This isn't fair. I mean, how does she deal with it? Um, <laughs> very difficult because she didn't want to come back. She has a daughter. She's actually of French nationality, is Yvonne. And her case is quite a well-known case. Um, Yvonne uh, Sneedon, uh, very well-known case. She had, um, she had a heart arrhythmia. So her body began to shut down due to extreme emotional distress and uh that's a whole another story of you know two angels appearing in her bedroom and telling her it's time to go and she had no fear she had no fear of going with them she went with them and she said she absolutely knew where she was going and before this had happened jimmy she was talking to her sister on the telephone in europe and was telling her sister that she'd had a premonition that she was going to die and uh, her sister couldn't understand it and thought, you know, she's just dreaming this. She's just thinking it up. But no, she did, in fact, die. And uh, that was due to emotional stress of heart arrhythmia that she had medication for and sleep apnea. Let's take our break right here. This is incredible. What a great conversation. I am your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Tracy Austin. We're talking about her new book. It's available on Amazon. You can also go to Tracy's website, I Survived Beyond and Back. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. Here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRA Radio. Buen amigo, Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not. When you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. What you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the 
the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) KGRARadio.com You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guest, Tracy Austin. More with Tracy in just a second. But right now, I want to talk to you about Virtual Shield. Virtual Shield VPN. Virtual Shield. Everybody today needs their own VPN. We know what's going on. Search engines, companies spying on you, getting your information, targeting you. That's what they do. You can surf everything privately with your own VPN. Nobody's going to know who you are or where you are. Virtual Shield is the only VPN I'll use for a lot of different reasons. First, they have a strict no logs policy. That's it. Second, encrypted servers all around the world. That's what you need behind you. I've got this beautiful studio, computers all over the place. All of them run Virtual Shield VPN. I said, uh, at the beginning of the show, I've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. We've got a new studio, totally undisclosed location. Nobody knows where I am. You can't find me through my ISP. It ain't going to happen. That's what you need. Virtual Shield VPN. It's easy to do. Go to virtualshield.com forward slash fade to black. That's it. You can also click on the link in the video description box below. Head straight over to Virtual Shield. If you do that, you will get Virtual Shield for 50% off today. Get Virtual Shield VPN now. All right. Our guest tonight, Tracy Austin, talking about her new book, I Survived Beyond and Back. And I want to I want to go through some of uh, your favorite uh, events uh, in the book, Tracy. But before we do... Religion. How many of near-death experiences are religious, are, 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 are a religious experience? Um, well, not all of them. And it doesn't mean to say that you know, the people in the book don't, uh, aren't religious, they don't believe in God or, or, or Jesus Christ. They do, but that doesn't always show itself to them. They don't always see Jesus. In the in the case of Yvonne that we mentioned before the break there, she did. She did see a light source that she explained and described was like a, a flickering flame that was moving towards her. And it was kind of, you know, almost dancing like a, a fire flame. But at the top of it, she said, as it got closer, she could see the face of Jesus. And she she knew. She knew it was Jesus, um, but not every not every case is, is like that. A lot do see 
uh, the deceased loved ones. Some do see angelic beings, but not everybody sees Jesus or somebody that claims, you know, in, in a some kind of form that they're God. So really, religious implications are there sometimes, but not all the time. It, has anybody used the word heaven? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, they, they've all kind of used that, that term heaven. Um, I know that with Yvonne, when I was interviewing uh, her and uh, about her encounter, she didn't want to call it the other side because, and I asked her why, she said she didn't want to call it the other side because people might be confused what the other side was. So she wanted to absolutely call it heaven. So I made a point of, of writing that in the book. Has anybody had a negative experience? Um, not in my accounts, but I can tell you that uh, when I interviewed Dr. Lauren Belge on my radio show, I had a, I asked her this question, and she said there was an account in there of a lady who had flatlined uh, due to a, a heart condition, I believe it was, and this particular lady had, she wasn't a very nice person in real life. And she was explaining to Dr. Belge that when she reached the other side, she was first of all thrown into darkness. There were screams she heard from a, a variety of areas in this darkness that she couldn't she couldn't place. And then she would see certain faces, uh, evil faces that would come close up. And she said that she she hadn't been a very good person, a very nice person in real life. She was mean. People had told her she was very mean. So when she came back, uh, Dr. Balch said that she decided she didn't want to be that person anymore. She wanted to change. And and she did. And she changed her ways. So I'd explain to, to Dr. Balch then, does this mean as below, so above? And she said, absolutely. Yeah, that's, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that's what would scare me. I, uh, I had on the show last year, uh, right in the middle of COVID, uh, the drummer for Death Angel. And he got COVID early on, but uh, a really severe case, went into a coma uh, for a, an extended period of time. And I, I, I don't recall if it was a week or two weeks, but he was in a coma for a long time. And his experience was in hell. I mean, and that's the only way that he can describe it and everything that it, it, uh, it changed him. And it was an experience he did not want to have again. He did not want to go back. And he was definitely changed. It changed him. It, it scared the crap out of him. And it, it does. I mean, I, like I said, I've not encountered anyone in my I, uh, my book, Jimmy, that uh, experienced hell as such. But you know what? I was I was listening to uh, I was listening to a show on Coast to Coast with this psychic medium, Matt Frazier. And Matt Frazier was asked the question, is is there a hell? He said no. He's never he's never communicated with any spirits in hell. There isn't there isn't such a place. So I don't know. I don't I don't know what to make of it. Uh, again, I haven't written about anybody in my book that experienced that, other than talking to Dr. Balge about that one lady who was was mean and knew she was mean and experienced what she experienced and decided, you know what, I've got to change. I don't want to be this person anymore. And she did. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, it can't all be bliss. Right. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, 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 it can't. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go through some of your, uh, uh, favorite, uh, survivors, uh, in the book. And, uh, what have you got for us first? Well, they're all great, Jimmy, to be honest. I love them all because they're all unique. They're all different, um, different scenarios of how they came to have their near death experience or out of body experience. But the very first one I write about is Tommy, uh, Tommy is such a great guy. He's a lovely, lovely chap. He's a, he's a biker. He loves his bike. And um, he was actually taking a vacation a number of years ago uh, with his wife to attend a family reunion in Colorado. 
and um, they became in they became involved in a terrible motorcycle accident while they were out there in um, in Colorado. Uh, they were heading to this reunion, and then after that, they were going to see his wife's friend. His wife was named Julie, and her best friend lived in an area called Norwood. And that's when the tragic accident happened. And um, they were traveling along the Highway 50 through Montrose area, uh, enjoying a beautiful summer day. And uh, they were only about 30 minutes away from reaching Julie's friend's house when the accident happen, happened. And approximately four o'clock that afternoon, the driver of a pickup truck spontaneously decided to make a left-hand turn right in front of Tommy's motorcycle. And he responded as, as quickly as he could. He, you know, he forced on the brakes, uh, which caused his motorcycle to skid approximately 180 feet before flipping and, and slamming their bodies with intense force into the rear end of the truck. And Tommy remembered nothing of the crash's actual impact. And his wife, Julie, instantly died at the scene. Um, eyewitnesses and other passersby stopped their cars immediately. They dialed 911. Uh, some of the onlookers ran frantically to assist them as they lay lifeless in the middle of the road. And although physically unable to move, Tommy found himself in and out of consciousness. And at one point, Tommy said he suddenly felt himself thrust out of his physical body and inexplicably standing at the roadside observing he and his wife's body. And he said he stood watching the scene of the accident as the first responders arrived. And uh, it, it was Tom, Tommy's first encounter of an NDE out of those three that he had. And although he did not think of it as a near-death, and this is, this is kind of odd because although he didn't think of it as a near-death experience, he considered himself to be dead. And he said, not that moment... I stood there on the side of the pavement. He says, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, I just died. And I thought, wow, it's, it's that simple. Wow, yeah. I just yeah. died. So um, he found himself drifting in and out of consciousness before entering this particular space of, of crossing over to the other side. Uh, he felt perplexed at what was happening as he encountered sensations, he said, of his spirit body being pulled in many directions. And he said he, he could simultaneously observe the crash scene, witnessing both the arrival of the police and the paramedics on the crash scene and, and of what was happening to him. So it, it's kind of like he was watching from a dual consciousness. And... Um, he said he could mentally see how each of the first responders and the police officers formed their mental images of what had happened at the crash scene. And he said it was as if Tommy could literally see inside each one of their minds, and especially that of other previous similar crash scenes that the paramedics had experienced throughout their careers. Mm. And um, he, he was telling me that the law in Colorado does not require a helmet to be worn when riding a motorcycle. And uh, in the police report, it stated that neither Tommy nor Julie were wearing a helmet that day. Uh, partly correct, because Tommy was not wearing a helmet, but instead he'd strapped it to his motorcycle. But, however, Julie, his wife, had worn a helmet for the entire trip, but due to the crash's impact, that obviously became loose and was, was thrown off. So um, he knew Julie had died with him and could see her, in spirit form, as she stood there by his side on the road, on the pavement. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, he said they crossed over together, and also at various moments he was aware of seeing previously deceased relatives, distant family members who had passed on many years before, and also there were other people there, Jimmy, who were unknown to him, people that he could not identify. So... Um, I guess this kind of thing happens that spirit, whoever they are, are pulled in to see what's going on and come to that person's aid to assist in some way. And, and then he was escorted to uh, a hospital. He was airlifted to a hospital at Grand Junction 
And that's where he had another near-death experience, again, in and out of consciousness, and then was... Well, let me, uh, let, in- me, let me stop you right there for a second. So he's with his wife. All of this is going on. Their, their bodies are in the street. They're observing it, uh, the paramedics, the police. It's, it's, it's an accident scene. And he knows that he is dead. Mm-hmm. How did he transition back to his body? I, did, did Was he conscious of that? Did he know what was going on? Yes, he knew. He knew that he'd, what his wife was, was going to remain there. Um, he talked about his children. Uh, I think one was 18 and one was 20. He had a son and a daughter. And he said that uh, he felt he had to come back because his children were so traumatic. He probably had a choice to stay with his wife, but he had to come back for his children. And, and that's what he did. He came back for his children. But interestingly, also, um, he talked about, Jimmy, how he there was the loss of ego when you encounter a near-death experience. The ego is completely gone. Um, I said to him, I, I like calling the ego etching God out or erroneous God operating is what I call it. And uh, he explained that, uh, you know, it, it's gone. When you when you when you're on the other side, he was told he was told that the ego is the only human condition, and that humans are the only animal in the physical world with one, uh, which, to all intents and purpose, creates issues and problems for personal gain. So, um, so he's tra- I- so he's transported back to the hospital, um, or to not back to the hospital to the hospital. Did they revive him? Did he come back consciously? Did he, away? I mean, what happened next? Well, the, he's on the operating table and he talks about how he's watching, he's now watching the doctors perform medical surgery on him and uh, from above. And he says at a certain point during the surgery, he heard one of the doctors telling the other, we've lost him. And that they should perhaps think of giving up on continuing with the surgery. And he said at that moment, he said, I I remember thinking to myself, that isn't up to you to make that decision. That that isn't up to you. And so within in moments, uh, he was no longer aware of what was going on consciously. So he, he lost consciousness completely. He could only later presume that at that point, the doctors kind of scurried around the room gathering the equipment to give him a round of shock treatment. And uh, after several attempts, you know, it obviously successfully brought him back into his body uh, as his, you know, his conscious awareness was no longer able to see from above. Right. Uh, When he regained consciousness, um, he said he decided not to share his near-death experience with the doctors and for a couple of reasons. And firstly, he said that, he needed to process the experience for himself, uh, which understandably would take some time to digest of, of what had happened to him. Um, and he said he could no longer continue living his life in the physical reality the same way that he had done for the past 50 years with the same thought process, the same ideas and the same outlook on life. And that uh, it made him look at life in a, in a completely different way. And he said, secondly, he felt that with all due respect to the doctors, they would not understand what had happened to him and that consciousness could even remotely separate itself from the physical body. So they were able to bring him back. Uh, like I said, he had three yeah, near death uh, uh, total. Yeah. Uh, what, tell me about the second NDE. Was it... Was it that well, this, day? Was it that week? It was that same day. It was It was actually when he was on the operating table, when the doctors were working on him. His consciousness was in and out. And then he left and was above his body a as second he time. himself. Yeah, a second yes. time. Yeah. And then, um, again, the third one was uh, as he had been brought back into his body. Again, he was still wavering in and out of consciousness and ended up back on the other side for momentarily and um and then decided you know because 
of seeing his children, what was happening to his children. He tried to telepathically communicate with them that he and his mother were okay, they were alive, they were fine, they were on the other side. But he said they were so distraught, he had to just, he had to come back. There was there was no way. Um, the third NDE, he, he, third NDE, like I said, he explained how to some degree he could telepathically transmit or project feelings to his teenage children here on the earth plane, trying to communicate with them to let them know that even though he and his wife had crossed over to the other side, that they were still alive or present and that both were okay. He tried to influence their thought process somehow in a positive way, but at the same time, he could also feel their animosity and resistance to what was happening around them. And he said from that dimension, he could feel that his children, his son 18 and his daughter almost 20, how badly they grieved and needed their parents and witnessed their emotional anxiety for at least one of them returning to the earth plane. So he did decide he needed to come back, and he did. I, I often wonder that when you're going through an experience like that and you get the second chance and you start having those thoughts, I need to make changes, I haven't been good, there's thing, you know, and you're going to make any deal with yourself at that moment. But then after life moves on, how many actually do change or do they fall back into their old ways? Um, I've, I've not encountered anybody who's done that fallen back into old ways. They, they, they have this whole new sense of renewed, like I have a second chance now. I have to make things work. I have to give it my best shot. So no, Jimmy, I haven't, I haven't heard of anybody falling back into old ways. No. Ah, because I think we all do. Right? You get well, you get one bad report card, you get in trouble, you get grounded. You're gonna now do your homework every night. You're now gonna study. You're gonna pass every test. That lasts for like six weeks, right? Yes, but this near death whole near death experience is a profound one. That cannot be denied. I don't know. Being grounded for a month was pretty profound <laughs> for me as a kid. I, I was a good girl. I've never been grounded. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, and and with Tommy, um, I'm picturing a certain guy. When you say motorcycle, I'm you know I'm picturing a, a, a biker. Was, was he a biker? Um, he wasn't a biker, biker, but he just liked that life of you know the leather jackets. He's got the beard. Right. Uh, just likes that freedom of riding his, his bike, so to speak. And, and what's he like today? What is he like today? Um, well, uh, he's a, a fascinating character. He's writing his own book based on his experience. And it's actually called The Ego System um, because he lost his ego during his near-death experience. He's a changed man, as a lot of people are. Um, he says that um, it, it's, uh, what did he say? He said that life is a blessing, he said, so we have to live it up and enjoy it. He said, well, we already come into the world knowing this. We already knowingly have the information because we all came from that dimension. Um, but unfortunately, he says, through life, it's taught out of us. And he said, love doesn't work so well here on the earth plane due to the system we have in place. It's all about love. They, all the, the NDE experiences talk about love. It's all about love on the other side. There's no negativity. There's no doubt. There's nothing like that. Um, for Tommy today, he's no longer afraid of dying, just like all the other NDE people, uh, or, or afraid of death. And... Um, he says he knows for sure that death is not the final outcome and that consciousness instantaneously survives the transition from the physical body to its spiritual one. Now, the obvious question, does he still ride a motorcycle? Yes. Really? Yes. And has he been in communication with his wife? I've asked him that question. He says periodically, yes, his wife will communicate with him. Now, you said something very, very interesting. Out of this whole story, uh, this whole experience, uh, probably the most interesting thing is that 
His wife transitioned. He did not. Mm-hmm. Why? Was it was that her decision? Why wouldn't she want? I, I it, it's just such a compelling part of the story. It is, and I I don't have an answer for that. As as does Tommy. Do, Tommy doesn't have an answer for that either. I mean, obviously, we have to say that it was her time to make that transition. It wasn't for some reason she was not meant to come back. Obviously, there was more to Tommy's life. He came back, and and not to hers, and not to hers. Yeah, right? that's it's just just and it must have been. We've all seen that sad movie, right? <laughs> we've seen it, mm-hmm. and that's like the it must be the saddest of all, knowing that you guys are going in two opposite directions that are the ultimate journeys. Exactly, exactly. It's a it's a very sad situation and has as he said to me you know Tracy there's many times where I feel very depressed I have those moments of depression I have moments of why why her why not me uh he said I I knew I had to come back I wanted her to come back with me but she she couldn't she was going to remain there um I don't know I mean only God really knows the answer to that question Absolutely incredible story, incredible story. I want to read his book uh, when it comes out. Uh, let's uh, let's get ready for our next break. Let's get this in. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I guess tonight, Tracy Austin. You can check out Tracy. When when is your show airing on what night on KGRA? It airs on Sunday nights at seven p.m. Pacific time to nine and ten to midnight Eastern. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Mental Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Why is it we're not very good with our health regiment? until it's too late? We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, Does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So, log on to GetTheTea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's GetTheTea.com. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard, available at orangeguard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Gold loves chaos. 
uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure. Aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market? We can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure. United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back. Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Tracy Austin. Great to have her back on the show. The new book is I Survived Beyond and Back. We're going to continue this discussion. Fascinating. I mean, all of this, uh, Tracy, is just so, so fascinating uh, to me. I know that uh, physics, I talk about this every night on the show. I'm repeating myself. Physics and science has a hard time discussing the soul and consciousness. They can't figure it out. And when you hear about experiences like this that so many have had, you know that there's something else going on. Science just wants to fight this, man. <laughs> it just, it, it does. It, it's fascinating to me, right? Yeah, uh, the, the, like you said, the law of, of gravity and physics we experience here on the earth plane it doesn't apply to the spiritual realm at all you know you know who is the most spiritual person in the world the physicist that's about to crash in a plane <laughs> dude i'm sorry <laughs> i'm so sorry i had it all wrong oh man <laughs> there you go <laughs> it's the truth man it's the truth uh richard dawkins man when the plane is going down is it's going to be the most spiritual man you know. Uh, okay. <laughs> that being said, uh, share another story with us. What have you got? Well, uh, we talked a little bit about Yvonne earlier. Um, Yvonne had her near-death experience in 2008. And um, she was raised in Belgium, uh, but she's a French nationality. She lived in France for a time. Uh, she held a professional career there in diplomacy as a consulate at the embassy. Um, but Yvonne's NDE happened while she was, you know, she'd moved to the United States here. And it was uh, the first of two near-death experiences, all within a three-week period. Mm -hmm. And the first occur occurred during her sleep apnea. And uh, the second happened weeks later when her heart had completely stopped beating. And, uh, and like I said previously, she had had a phone conversation with her sister in Europe. And uh, she, t she told her that she, she felt she was going to die. Well, one particular night, as Yvonne was getting ready to go to bed, having taken medication for sleep apnea, she lay resting on the bed with her head on the pillow. And suddenly, Yvonne could see herself lying there in the bed with her head on the pillow. And at the foot of the bed stood two giant beings of light, angelic beings that were dressed in long white robes who telepathically communicated with Yvonne and told her that it was now time to go. 
And she told them that she was going to go with them and she felt no fear whatsoever. Was this the uh, first NDE or the second? This was the first. The first. Okay. Uh, let's stop right mm -hmm. there for a second. She, w was she at this moment? Was she OBE watching the two beings uh, look at her in bed? Or was set that up for me? Well, um, let's see here. Like I said, she was she was lying, resting in the bed with her head on the pillow. Now, obviously, she, she must have, through her medication of sleep apnea, she was out of her body. Because she could see herself lying there in the bed with her head on the pillow. Right. So she was out right. of her body. She was OBE. She was OBE. And at the foot of the bed, she stood, uh, th th there stood at the bottom of the bed, two beings of light, angelic beings, dressed in long ro white robes who telepathically communicated with her and said it was time to go. Fear whatsoever. She had no fear of letting go of her body. And she just described it as a normal natural feeling which is odd to understand but that's what she said and she said um in 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 the beginning of the book here uh jimmy i actually put a little quote that belonged to uh that what john lennon had actually said in that uh, he wasn't afraid of death because it's just getting out of one car or one vehicle and into another and she agreed uh, with with that, uh, in, you know, John Lennon's quote at the beginning of this book, um, she said, in that, in that a person's physical body is like that of a car. Your spirit is the driver inside the vehicle. You get out of the vehicle and you no longer have any regard or use for it. And, she, and although Yvonne knew that she would be leaving a family and a daughter behind, as much as she loved her daughter, who was the number one person in her life, she described the feeling as being transported into another dimension, another new reality, and moving forward, and that everyone and everything that she'd left behind would be totally fine. She didn't feel any, any sadness. She just knew that everything would be okay. And she explained that the two beings were escorts from heaven and that they had come to pick her up and were leading her towards a specific location, taking her to where she called back home, heaven. And she said she felt uh, a mighty power from these two beings and knew that no harm would come to her as she stood in between the, the two of them. And she described in a split second how she was traversing across the entire universe, finally, finally arriving in a place uh, wholly illuminated with pure light. And she said she realized she had been transported to another dimension where she called heaven. And waiting for her there was a group of uh, a relatively large group of people who approximately 25 people or so, all showing their excitement for her return home and they greeted her with words like uh, she's back she's back and uh, she said that Yvonne felt the celebration and the rejoicing of her return and although she felt she knew them and that they were familiar to her she she could not recognize them right away uh, but knew them to be from what she referred to as her soul group um so wow that is interesting that whole thing Yep. So she she's traveling the stars. Yes. Right? And I've often thought about that. So many have talked about, you know, that uh consciousness and soul, you know, it's 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 universal, has to be everywhere, right? That's right. And That's right. I don't know where I don't know if we stay on this earth. Right, <laughs> in that you maybe reincarnate or incarnate, reincarnate into another body. Maybe you're a dog. Maybe you're a schnauzer. Uh, maybe you're a human, and you're in a young baby that's being born. There's that, or do you go to another star system? Right? Do you go to another planet? Well, it's a million dollar question, isn't it? I mean, a, a lot of people who have the near death experiences, a lot of them do describe themselves as if they are out there in space. 
Right. They do describe that. Um, and that's what she described. And she said that um, the, these group of people, about 25 or so, were all waiting there for her return home, as she called it. And um, although they were familiar to her, she couldn't recognize her from a, her soul group, souls she'd incarnated with or reincarnated with numerous times and described the moment as returning home to her real family. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. want to. I, I don't want to check it out now, but I do want to check it out eventually. That's uh, that's <laughs> no, incredible. No, not just yet, eh? We'll just give it some time. Yeah, let's get. I, I'm <laughs> cool right ready. now. I, I I got more guitars to hang on the wall yet. <laughs> um. It, uh, oh, I wanted to. Oh, hold on. We got to get back to Yvonne. Do you still play piano? Do you know what, Jimmy? <laughs> I haven't played for the whole 20 years I've been on American soil. That's not right. You don't even go to like no. Guitar Center and go in and, and around? No, I don't. I mean, occasionally if someone has a, a keyboard at their home, I have a little play around. But I mean, that's all it really is. It's like my life went down a completely different path, yeah, you know? I, I know, I know. I did the, t the TV show in California for six years and I, I just got involved with uh, media and it's like my instrument just took a back seat. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Do you have a keyboard in the house somewhere in the closet with dust on it? Oh God, you're going to hate me for this. No. Okay. <laughs> I, listen, I will get a, a grand piano at some point. Don't I, that yeah. I don't do. don't don't procrastinate. Do it tomorrow. No, do it tomorrow. Shoot me an email, Jimmy. <laughs> check out my new grand piano. Um, okay, back to Yvonne. Okay, so <laughs> she's with her soul group somewhere in the universe, but she comes back. What happens? Well, first of all, though, um, while she's there with that group, by the way, she does recognize us. I, I found this to be very interesting. She recognized a certain lady standing in the group who made her way forward. And she said after a few moments of trying to remember who this lady was, she had a strong recollection of when she was a teenager, approximately 13, 14 years old, and that this lady was the mother of uh, one of her friends whose house she'd stayed in um, at a time for, for a few months. She said, and her friend's mother cared for Yvonne for those few months as if she were her own daughter. And Yvonne remembered the intense connection that they had both shared. And she said, upon stepping forward, the lady touched Yvonne's cheek, telling her that she knew Yvonne's life on earth was a difficult one. Uh, and, but she said, still, however difficult, she explained that Yvonne had to go back and somewhat quickly before her body could not accept her soul again. So uh, Yvonne acknowledged the conversation and uh, indeed of the, the difficulty she was experiencing of her life on earth. And uh, at that very moment, the same two angelic beings who had first escorted her to heaven was standing at her side, now ready to take her back mm. at lightning-like speed to where they'd initially appeared in Yvonne's bedroom. And uh, she went back. She went back to her body. And now, this was while she was sleeping. Or, or did she just come back to life? She just came back to life. I mean, she, she lived alone. Right, right, right. Yvonne, Yvonne lived alone. And by the way, she was always terrified of, of, of somebody coming into the house and finding her dead. We and all being fear naked. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I've, she I've, joked with, <laughs> with her sister about it and saying, I'm making sure I'm dressed all the time just yes, in case somebody comes by and yes. finds me. Uh, when, I, when I lived alone, I had this crazy fear, right? Like, for real that I would be found dead in the wrong situation, right? Whatever that situation may be, I didn't want to go out like that, right? And, and it happened because I had seen uh, a photograph. I was studying at the time I was researching um, spontaneous human combustion, okay? 
That's what I was I was researching at the time. Interesting. And I and and I come across a, a photograph of a guy that had spontaneously human combusted, but he was found in this recliner in his boxer shorts, right, with a TV remote in his hand. Oh. Right. Oh. Like that. I don't want to be found like that. No. <laughs> Not in my no. boxers with a remote. With the recline, no, no, I don't want to go I, out like that. I guess you have really no say in it, do you? Really, <laughs> just be fully clothed at least. Just be fully clothed <laughs> at least. That's I, right. I don't want my pale white ghost, you know, stay puff. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, I don't want to be found like that. Okay, so now she comes back. She is back, and all of this was a conscious memory for her. She remembered everything. She did. Yeah. And, and you know what? The most, most in the majority, most NDE experiences do remember because, Jimmy, it's, it's a profound experience. It's something that people just don't forget because of what happened to them. It was just so unbelievably profound. Three weeks after um, Yvonne's initial NDE, she then experienced her second encounter. Um, um, Yvonne sat reading a book on her couch one day and she began to feel all of her organs shutting down within moments. Hmm. And uh, as painful as that might sound, Yvonne said that she felt no physical pain whatsoever because at that precise moment, she felt herself slipping out of her physical body only to find herself immediately transported into a light. Um, for Yvonne, there was no tunnel of light, uh, like so many other near-death experiences describe. Um, but in her case, she was immediately transported directly into it. And she described the light as if, which I found interesting, she described it as if on an intense foggy morning and not being able to see any surroundings um, as, as the fog, or in this case, the light. I'd submerged her completely in it. She said there was no beginning to it and there was no end to it. Only the overwhelming intensity of love and brightness from the light that permeated her entire being. And she said she was alone in the light. She felt nothing but unconditional love and joy and this incredible euphoric state of being, which all NDE people say they feel. Uh, she said no worries of any kind and felt nothing but one of well-being. Her mind was alert. Her vision was perfectly clear, along with her awareness, which was greatly heightened, as all NDE experiences say, that they have uh, a heightened awareness of everything. Colors are so vivid. There is no uh, no name to describe the colors that are seen on, on the other side. And um, she explained that heaven is a place of experience where there's no doubt, there's no negative thoughts and one of all knowing. And she says she prefers to call it heaven rather than the other side, as she explained that people may be conf confused as to what the other side is. But by calling it heaven, people will probably have uh, some form of a, an understanding and a sense of it being an actual place, because that's what she said she, she went to. She went to an actual place. Um, she said it was vast, it was expansive, and this is what she observed of her time being there, and that the vastness and the magnitude of it made her think of the well-known verse from the Bible, uh, in my father's house there are many mansions, relating it to the many different dimensions and levels of the spirit world. And she said she was submerged in this beautiful, radiant, all-embracing light. Uh, she wasn't alone for long and in the dissolute energy form of some kind making its way towards her. And um, it resembled that of a fire flame. And she said it was spontaneously moving, hovering and flickering as it made its way in her direction. Except the fire flame was that of pure energy and nothing but light. And as the energy form moved closer, Yvonne said she could see a face sitting at its top and immediately knew this was Jesus. And she said now directly in front of her, the energy form suddenly wrapped itself around Yvonne, engulfing her. 
and she said she felt what she could only describe as the purest form of a love of both a father and a mother all blended into one. She said, as if it was the most perfect of love from two parents, protective, nurturing, caring and secure. Yet strangely, the energy was neither male nor female. Uh, an unexplainable combination of both. So um, now, did you did you ask her why she thought that the two NDEs were so different? Right, the first one, two beings take her across the universe, you know, and 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 there were her, her soul family was there to greet her. This mm -hmm. didn't happen during the second event. Why were they right, so it different? Didn't happen. Um, she doesn't know. I mean, obviously, it was both two two medical conditions. The first one, uh, heart arrhythmia, and the second one was um, the whole. But she knew what she felt. She knew where she was. Uh, she knew that she had reached the other side. She didn't want to come back, even though she was leaving her daughter to to be by herself. Um, it was just, a an amazing experience. She said she did actually end up walking towards a celestial city with Jesus himself. And there was angels, angelic beings there and, and children, um, that were there being cared for by angels. Fascinating. Um, now how, how does this second experience um, and how did she get back to her body and why? Um, she said that um, she just obviously, you know, came came back in, in her in her bed. I don't think she she didn't go to the hospital or anything like that. Um, she described how she just come back into her body. No, and, uh, um, well, the second experience, I th wasn't she reading a book on the couch? She had been reading a book on her couch. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, with her organs shutting down, was she revived? Was she taken to the hospital or did all of this again just happen at her home? It happened at her home. And she again, she re-entered her physical body. Right. Describing it as a natural feeling. Um she didn't feel any pain back in her body, describing it as a natural feeling. And uh, not all NDE experiences return to their physical bodies without experiencing some form of pain. But in, in, in Yvonne's case, her lack of pain was an exception. But no, she just ended up back in her body, re-entering her body. That's fascinating. And uh, was there any... Uh, explanation for why her organs shut down? Um, it had been due to the medication was too strong. Wow. The medication was too strong for her body. That's incredible. That's incredible. Before we head to the break, oh, um, uh, do, you, do you have a short NDE experience you can share with us before the break? When we come back, we haven't talked about UFOs tonight. I'm going to ask you to stay over for overtime. There's so much that is going on in the UFO community right now, and I haven't spoken to you in quite a while. I want to get all of your insight on that. So we'll come back uh, to that. Is there a story that you can share with us? Um, yeah, the, the, it isn't a, a near-death experience because those are quite lengthy in the book, but I can tell you about my out of body experience that I had, Jimmy. Please. Um, yeah, I've, I've never experienced a near death experience. And this is when I lived in England. I went to bed one night. Um, I was uh, obviously living in the house with, with my, my partner at the time back then. And this was many, many years ago, some 20 plus years ago. And um, I'd gone to bed and literally just got into bed, hadn't even fallen asleep. And as I'm lying there, I'm lying on my right hand side and I, I can still see it to this day and I'm facing the window, the curtains were drawn and all of a sudden it's like my body started to roll to the left hand side as if I'm falling out of the bed and I hold on to my duvet and I remember saying to myself as I'm rolling, 
oh, like, what the hell's happening? Mm. And I expect it to fall on the floor. Mm -hmm. And I write about it in the book, um, in the chapter of OBEs versus NDEs, because the similarities, but they are different. And so as I'm thinking I'm going to hit the floor, there is a moment of nothingness. And then I, my consciousness is there, and I'm thinking, where the hell am I? And I'm staring up at the ceiling. But it took me a few moments to understand that I'm looking at the ceiling. And, um, and I'm there, and I've got my, my hands palm upwards towards the ceiling. And in this particular, a lot of homes in England, uh, Jimmy, especially in old homes, older homes, we have something called artexing. And our text in plaster. And there was our texting on this particular ceiling in the house that we were renting at the time. And I, I didn't know where I was. It took a few moments to realize, oh my God, I'm up at the ceiling. And I could feel all of the pattern of the plaster, the swirls in the pattern of the plaster on my palms. And I realized, oh my God, I'm up at the ceiling. Hmm. And I started to move myself along the ceiling. And um, I never had that thought to look back at my body in the bed because to me, there was no body in the bed. To me, I was there up at the ceiling. I was there. So um, it didn't last long. I mean, it only lasted about 12 to 15 seconds at the most. But it was the most odd, peculiar thing that's, that's really happened. I mean, even out of UFO sightings and having some involvement with beings, that is the most oddest of things I've ever experienced. Now, okay, I'm going to ask you the simple question. What were you doing the night before? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I don't remember. I, it, was, it was nothing that I shouldn't have been doing. Let's put it that way. I uh, think I might have remembered that. <laughs> how uh, 15 seconds, uh, do you remember transitioning back into your body? No, just straight in my body, straight back in my body. And when I woke in the morning, I remembered it and I didn't know what it was. I don't know what, and I, I actually went online and tried to do some research and that's when I come to find out, oh God, I had a, an out of body experience. That's what it was. Have, have, so, did you try to maybe figure out how it was done and tried to repeat it? Um, not about it, but I, you know, my mind takes me back to that particular night. There's nothing that I did out of the ordinary. It was just going to bed in a, an ordinary night, going to bed. But like I said to you earlier about uh, out of body experience, it typically happen either in a going into a sleeping state or a waking state with out-of-body experiences. And mine did actually go into, as I was going into a sleeping state, but I wasn't asleep yet. You know, so many have been able to practice the art of uh, astral projection and, and leave their bodies and travel and go to different cities and travel around the planet. I've never been able to do it. I haven't done it accidentally either, like you did. not I... I want to experience it, but I just don't know how. It, it, yeah, it's. I, I would. I would. I don't know if I'd like to to learn how to do it or not. I don't know. I mean, it was very spontaneous. There was no thought process to it. I hadn't a clue what was going on. Um, all I know is that I found myself back in my body. My body had a way of being able to find itself back in naturally. That, it, it was just amazing. It was a magical duvet. That's a what it was. magical duvet. <laughs> Let's yeah. take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Tracy Austin. And now we, we come back. We're going to talk UFOs. We have to talk ET. We have to talk UAPs. Uh, she's a fantastic radio host and researcher and experiencer. And I haven't talked to Tracy in a couple of years. So let's do that when we... Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. 
This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device, or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today, and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. <laughs> It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Tracy Austin is with us, radio host, TV personality, and UFO researcher and experiencer. And when we head into overtime, one of the things that I like to do is to loosen up a little bit. Uh, that was a pretty intense conversation tonight, Tracy. NDEs are a very, very serious subject, and uh, uh, the book is amazing. I encourage everybody to go and, and get it. I survived beyond and back, but now I want to talk UFOs. Um, pretty crazy times we're living in right now with uh, the mass media and everything. What do you think is actually going on? Oh, boy, that's a million-dollar question, isn't it, really? Um, I've seen so many articles coming out over the last few weeks of different things. You know, the Pentagon confirming that the recent uh, UAPs, UFO leaks, were genuine, um, that the Navy had actually taken photographs and footage. Uh, So much is going on. Yes, I'm beginning to think, oh, my gosh, Jimmy, is this it? Is this what we've all been waiting for? Is it now time to uh, spill the beans on this is disclosure around the corner. Do you think that it is? I think something's coming. I think something's coming. Um, I didn't know. I've never really thought if the government would be the establishment to release anything like that. But it seems to be some some of it is coming from there. I always thought that the science community would be the ones to actually 
release some kind of information. But uh, nah, it seems that the governments uh, or, or divisions of the governments are acknowledging this. It seems which is, which is great. Okay, um, is it a comfortable zone for us to be in to have the government suddenly be our friend? Right. When it comes to UFOs, when it's been nothing but ridicule, crazy tinfoil hat conspiracy UFO people. And now suddenly we're to embrace the government and and appreciate. think there's a couple of ways of, of looking at that i mean do we trust the government do we trust the government to be truthful with us um i i don't know and i think in a lot of cases it's hard to trust the government do we if we really think about it do we really need disclosure are we have we not already had disclosure do we really need a, a president or someone from the government to yep it's absolutely real we have been visited uh, a long, 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 long time, and we've had to keep it from you because um, I think disclosure kind of already is among us. Well, that's degree. the question I'm going to ask you. You just asked the question out loud without answering it. Do we need the president on live television? Um, I don't think so. Probably some people do need it. Probably some people do need the president to say it. And others don't, because we all know, we all know there's something going on. More and more people now who have been skeptics are now seeing things that they haven't seen before and beginning to understand what is that? What am I looking at? Is this what they term a UFO? Um, so we don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm kind of on the fence with it. Sometimes I, I think to myself it would be great and other times no, because we already know. What would it do? Really, what would it do? Well, f for many that have an emotional, personal reason for being in this community, they need something official. They need that confirmation. And I totally get that. And every time I go into that uh, position, argument, if you will, that we don't need disclosure. We've already seen what... We I, you get so much pushback from taking that stance where I think the vast majority of the UFO community wants, needs, and expects, you know, something official to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's, and I, I totally understand where they're coming from. I totally get it. Me saying, I don't need disclosure, man. It's already here. I've seen stuff in the sky. I know things. That's going to create an argument. That That is a bad position, I think, for most of us to take when uh, I'm talking about radio hosts and people that are in a position to speak on this subject, when the vast majority, they are waiting for that moment, right? Mm. They are anxiously waiting for something official. Some probably are, and they, like you said, they, that's that's what they need. Perhaps they they have to have that. I mean, I I interview. How much of it are they going to tell us? I I interviewed Jorge Martin Miranda a few Sundays ago from Puerto Rico. Oh yeah, and I had. Uh, I by the way, uh, uh, I had Serena Wright Taylor on the show last night, and you know she's in constant contact with Jorge, and she was so excited that you were going to be on the show tonight, that Jorge was on your show. Yeah. Well, I, I enjoyed, uh, I've always wanted to interview him and I, I never had the platform to do it, but with KGRA, I had the platform to do it and I did a, a full two hour show. And Jimmy, it's amazing what people are encountering out of Puerto Rico. And it's not just UFOs and ETs. They're now having sightings of gargoyles. Oh, I haven't heard that one yet. Yes, gargoyles. And uh, what is it about Puerto Rico, man? <laughs> that's what I asked him. That's what I asked Jorge. I said Mexico has has all of these different things going on. Puerto Rico, uh, some of the Caribbean islands. What is it? And um, of course, he he didn't know. He couldn't answer it. But people are now seeing gargoyles out there. And these gargoyles are, you know, uh, nine, ten feet tall. And he, he gave me a, a situation, uh, a story. Uh, 
person's roof of a home. No way. Yeah, fighting. I, I, I got to get Jorge on this show. Um, I want oh, okay. Let's let's back up for a second. You, this is what I find really interesting about the UFO subject is the Pentagon said last week that yes, these videos are real. What the Pentagon didn't say, yeah, they're real videos. Okay, all right. They didn't say these are of ufos and things not of this earth that's not what the pentagon said but the ufo community and those talking about this suddenly want to put the spin on this that the navy shot videos of pyramid shaped flying objects right and it but it's the community two things are happening at the same time the community is accepting that. And number two, the media is okay with saying that, that the Navy has shot UFOs that were swarming uh, over uh, some of their ships. It's never been like that before in the media or with the community and pop culture. It's pretty crazy. It is. Um, it's it's surprising, but it's also su surprising in a good way, I think. And uh, there was an interesting clip that I put on my Facebook page about uh, a, few, a few days ago. I think it was the April the 6th. Uh, a very interesting clip of an interview from former CIA director, um, James Wolseley. Wolsey. Uh, he said that he hopes that uh, we can be friendly with him. This was something from the Black Vault yeah, with John Greenwald. Very John interesting Greenwald. interview. Yes. Yeah. So, we're, I mean, that's a ex, the former CIA director saying these things. It's it's getting pretty wild. I, d I don't know what to make of it, in all honesty. Do do we trust what, what we are being told or what we're seeing? Do we think something's going to come forward? Is there some disclosure? I would hope so. I hope something is coming. Um. But again, how much of it are we going to be told? Now, well, that's the question that everybody is asking about the UAP's task force report that is due to the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, I think uh, the UFO community, and I understand why, is hopeful that something is going to be in that report uh, that references ET or something off-world. Do you think that we will see something like that in this report? Um, I don't know. I would hope that we could have something that would give us some information of, of actually what is going on here. I mean, it's been going on for so long. I mean, years ago, I used to say, you know, well, maybe five, five years down the road, something will come forward, something will be released. And, of course, five years comes and goes. And there's nothing. This, I think, is the closest to it that I've seen in a long time. Yeah, it's tangible. It's tangible. It's tangible. Yeah, it's not intangible. Like it, it, like it used to be. Um, now, there's also uh, a lot of chatter uh, that is going around about uh, an alien invasion or a false flag. And this is you know, starting to prep us for that. And that's why the space force was created and the funding and, and how the military is getting involved with this. Do you think a false flag and alien invasion is possible? Well, I think anything's possible, isn't it? Really? I think it's, I think it is possible. Why? why? Yes. A anything is possible, <laughs> but why uh, ultimately, why would, something like that happen is it to unite the planet is it to fund the military you know why would that type of uh uh conspiracy be played on the world i have no idea well control don't you think control think of the control. masses control of the masses for example here's an example that i saw on uh, instagram today Pfizer announces COVID-19 vaccine upgrade. Now includes Microsoft chip for reduced symptoms. What? Well, now, what do you think about that? Now, who posted that? 
This is this was posted by uh, a friend of mine named Sloan Bala under the t- term of politics. Pfizer announces COVID-19 vaccine upgrade now includes Microsoft chip for reduced symptoms. Now, so what, how, how can we trust any of this? This is, you know, when I, when I hear something like that and anything is possible, of course, but if you consider everything that we went through in 2020 with, you know, thousands of different conspiracy theories, not only about uh, COVID, but politics or religion or race or the, the Bill Gates, whatever, everything was uh, uh, put out there. And one of the things when you have all these blown up headlines and all of this controversy and the way that social media deals with it, you've got four and a half million people on this planet on the Internet. Right. So these stories flourish and spread. And then the UFO situation in E.T. and contact is blurred. That's hidden with everything else that is exploding out into the headlines. And that's the fascinating part. When you hear something like what you just said right there, E.T. is not even in the picture of extraordinary. Right? It's like, if right. You, right? If you're going to bury a story, <laughs> E.T. Yes. contact, uh, everything else that's going on, well, last year was the craziest year in the history of, of, of everything. And so the question right. of ET contact gets lost. That's right. It takes a backseat. Compl- so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it takes a backseat. So it makes you think, you know, what do we trust here? What is the real deal? Um, we, it's like we don't know what to believe anymore, Jimmy. And, and people have been, you know, if we, if we just talk about the vaccine at the moment for COVID, people have been talking about, the, you know, wanting to... Uh, have world domination over the the masses with this vaccine that includes a microchip and that Bill Gates has been wanting to do that forever. What do we see in this post that this vaccine can now be upgraded with a Microsoft chip? A Microsoft chip for reduced symptoms. Hmm. That um, that needs to be fact-checked. I'm not going to go down that road too quickly. I mean, that scares me. And uh, let me tell you why that scares me. Is DARPA, uh, along with the military and physicians, have developed a chip that goes under your skin that will tell you if you have COVID before you have symptoms. Now, that's, that isn't a press release. That is uh, an actual government release. That is... Uh, from DARPA and from the U.S. military. That's pretty scary. The okay. other part of this, and this was an interview with uh, one of the developers of this chip. He, he, then he went on to say, this is two, two days ago, he went on to say, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, we have also developed a filter that will remove the virus from your blood with a dialysis machine. Okay. Now, that's oh crazy. And, and, and DARPA said, well, we're trying to figure out ways, this is the military, right? We're trying to develop ways to end pandemics. Now, so you hear that, and that's a fact, right? Th- these are facts, and then you hear something like what you're saying, and the two are not far removed from each other. It's pretty fascinating. Right. Pretty fascinating days that we find ourselves in. It uh, is, and it's all it's all fear based, isn't it? All of it, all of all it. All of it's fear based. Now, and here's the other part: you closure with ET, and if we take a look at this uh, as a whole, the way the media has been dealing with the ET question lately, you have science talking about uh, how many planets are now uh in our milky way 80 billion that are rocky earth like that could have life on it all in the goldilocks zone 80 billion in 1995 we had one right now today they're talking about 80 billion now we've got uh radio signals coming from 
uh, uh, Jupiter. We've got a uh, fast radio burst coming in from different parts of the universe. Uh, we have all of this activity in the world of science that is making its way. We've got the Pentagon and we've got the Senate Intelligence Committee. We have the UAP task force. All of that is going on at the same time. And it seems like a concerted effort marketing campaign to push the ET agenda out into the public for acceptance. I just don't know why. Uh I don't either. But, you know, some years ago, there was, I to think of her name, I can't think of her name. There was a Chinese representative, a Chinese scientist that was picked at the United Nations as an ambassador to actually, she was appointed to actually be the first person, uh, the first point, of, first point of contact for ETs should they land on American soil. And I just can't think of her name, but she was a she's a Chinese uh, scientist that was appointed. She was the first point of contact. So wh what's what's that all about? It's all happening at the same time. And yeah. I, I now the the fake alien invasion part, you can put that on the back burner. But it feels to me I, I and my gut is never wrong. I think the government knows something eminent is about to happen. We just had Oumuamua, you know, cruise yes. through our yes. our solar system and, and uh, Avi Loeb's great new book, Extraterrestrial, uh, describing this through data as a possible uh, object that was built outside of our uh, star system. Now, all of this is happening at the same time. I, you, you have to think that maybe the government knows of an imminent situation that they've got to get out in front of. Hmm. Yeah, they do. Um, but you know, you also think back to 1947 and, and the crash of Roswell that so many people are so tired of hearing and the lies about all of that, that that really didn't happen. That was just dummies that were in some kind of test mm -hmm. in the desert. Um, I think that they've had their, I think the government have had their back, uh, they've been pushed to the wall, that they, they, they don't know how to come forward with this. They don't know what to say. I think they know certain things. I, I don't know if they know everything, but I think they know enough, but are afraid to actually say outright because then they've got egg on their faces they, they would have a lot trusted. yeah they would have a lot of explaining to do uh, a lot of for explaining. for sure now um and to take all of this a step further when you have uh the navy you have the pilot testimony you've got those three videos that came out uh three almost four years ago now with these recent videos it seems that it's a United States Navy issue suddenly. It's not an Air Force issue, and it's not a civilian issue where we have had so many people like yourself that have had their own experiences. But the government isn't hearing that side of the story. They're only getting the military fear-based agenda uh, presented to them. Shouldn't they hear from people like you and I? Oh, I think they absolutely should. I mean, it, it, it's, and I said this on the, the show on Sunday when I talked about it briefly. It's, it's like um, we're stuck in time. The government's stuck in time of still asking, are UFOs real? We are so beyond that, Jimmy. We're so beyond, are UFOs real? What about abductions? Let's talk about right. the many millions of abductions. Let's talk about the objects that are found in people's bodies. That uh, my dear friend, the, the late Dr. Roger Lear, who I was great friends with, um, removed 17 suspected alien implants up until his death. And then, of course, Daryl Sims, great guy who's now doing this and removing implants as well. Um, something's going on. The government knows this. It's like they don't want to see that part of it. They don't want to understand it. They don't want to acknowledge it. They only want to go back as far as, are UFOs real? 
we are beyond that. Do you think, uh, one last uh, question, uh, which is the other million dollar question, um, and it's not just the United States government, but let's just stay there for now. Do you think that the government is in possession of retrieved alien vehicles? Maybe they were gifted one. Maybe one crashed. But do you think that they are in possession of uh, crashed alien vehicles? I do. And I don't think they're at Area 51. I'm in, in I, listen, I'm in Las Vegas. I live in Las Vegas. I see the Janet airplanes all the time. Um, I think that's just a front. We know black project, you know, black budget projects go on at Area 51. I don't think there's anything there or very little. I think it's all there at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. You know, when I lived in California, Jimmy, I always seem to get involved with people who are involved in the UFO subject of some kind. And when I first uh, came to the United States, and I was, uh, I'm now a citizen, but at the time I had to wait until I could get my green card for me to, to have a job. And so I worked at, when I did get my green card, I worked for an ophthalmologist in California. And every Tuesday, there would be a gentleman that would come by who was the contact lens guy. Mm -hmm. And I only ever knew his first name as Doug. And uh, I was there in the ophthalmologist's office with, with other, other girls, other employees, and, and Doug would come by. And at the time, the movie came out, Signs. Mm -hmm. with Mel Gibson. Mm -hmm. And so we're all sitting there having a, a conversation on this particular Tuesday. And I turned to Doug and I said to Doug, what do you think, Doug? Uh, have, have you seen that movie signed yet? He said, no, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I, I plan to. And I said, what do you think? Do you think there is life out there in the universe? And he said, um, I kind of think that there is. And I said, uh, have you had experiences or, or something? And he said, well, he said, I'll tell you this. He said, I was at my, my parents' house one night and uh, my, my father was upstairs. My mother was downstairs. And my mother shouts up to my father and says, you're on the TV. Come downstairs. And I said, you're on the TV, come downstairs. Who is your father? His father, Jimmy, was General Exxon. And I said, oh, my God. You're kidding me. He says, no, my father is General Exxon. My father was there at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base the day that they bought that crash disc in with those bodies. My father had to oversee that craft coming in. And I'd never had a conversation with Doug. I didn't even know his last name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like everywhere I go, there is someone who's involved with this subject. And so I said to him, well, do you think your dad would be okay with the little blonde British girl interviewing him? He said, well, you perhaps ought to give him a call. He said, I'm, I'm not going to give you his number. I'm not going to openly give that to you, but look in the yellow pages. He lives on Riverside. So I thought to myself, he doesn't want me to interview his dad. I won't, I won't do it. I, sh I wished I'd have done it now, but I didn't do it. So many years later, when I moved to Las Vegas, I suddenly thought to myself, you know, maybe I ought to think of interviewing General Exxon. So uh, I looked up in the, the, the yellow pages. I found him on Riverside. I called and he'd actually passed away uh, a year or two previous. So I couldn't interview him. You so missed it. I, I missed that opportunity and I could kick myself for it because I might have been the only person that had gotten that close. I could have interviewed him about that time when the disc came in and the bodies came in. Tracy, thank you so much for an absolute extraordinary show tonight. Everybody can catch you Sunday nights on KGRA. KGRA, uh, Sunday nights, 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern, 7 to 9 Pacific. Who do you have on this week? 
Um, this week is actually going to be a repeated show. I'm actually taking the Sunday off. Oh, you can't but, do that. Uh, I, I know I have to. I have to this Sunday. But we will be back uh, the following Sunday. And uh, I'm hoping to have on Don Phillips from the UK who owns uh, the American Supernatural website. So we're going to talk to Don about some amazing stuff. Thank you so much, Tracy. Be safe out there. Let's talk soon. Thank you for having me on, Jimmy. It's a pleasure. What a great show. What a great conversation. Tracy Austin. And again, Tracy, uh, the Tracy Austin show.com. The links are over at Jimmy church radio.com. We just, we just went past it, blew past everything. I got to get straight to the credits. Faded Black's executive producer is Rita Camarion. Show is produced by Hill J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast owned a copyright of 2021 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, Fader Night, open lines all night long. Until then, I want everybody to be safe. It's now time to Fade to Black. <laughs>